Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining in for this webinar. My name is Vipul and I lead co-marketing for VWO. I'll be your moderator for today. For those who are hearing about VWO for the first time, VWO is the world's most trusted and easiest to use A-B testing and conversion rate optimization platform. Presenting the webinar today is Michael Labs, the co-founder and strategy director at Yoga Digital. Hello, Michael. Good morning. Great to have you here. So before I let Michael introduce himself and start with his presentation, I request everyone to ask any questions that you might have using the GoToWebinar's question panel. With that, Michael, let's begin. Awesome. Uh, thanks very much for making time, everyone. I appreciate that there are people tuning in from all over the world. Um, so it's 7 a.m. here in sunny Sydney. Um, and I just wanted to apologize in advance, as you can hear, my voice is a little bit Barry White-esque. I've been sick, so please bear with me. Um, so just to kind of keep things off and tell you a little bit about Yoga Digital first, for those of you who don't know us, um, this is our wonderful team based in Sydney. Um, I actually wanted to give a very quick shout out to Jess, who uh, is one of our former family members who's currently online on the other side of the world with, with her new team. Um, so just wanted to say hello. Um, so we, Yogurt was started five years ago. I'm, I'm one of three co-founders. And Yogurt was founded on the premise um, that all digital strategies should be data-driven. A cookie cutter approach just isn't good enough these days. Um, so this wonderful team that you see on this slide um, are kind of split between driving traffic and converting traffic. And as an agency, we have a very big focus on understanding the customers of our customers. So in terms of our DNA, um, this is actually our company tagline. It's also our ethos and it's one of our core values. Um, a love affair with data, not opinions. Um, it's a huge part about what we do is trying to understand, again, um, who the customers of our clientele are and then building strategies around their pain points and motivations. So this is kind of integrated into everything that we do. And I'm gonna show you guys today uh, which tools to use and what strategies you can implement to take the same approach within your business. Um, in terms of the type of clients that we work with, just, uh, just a quick one to wrap up about yogurt. Um, we work with everyone from publicly listed billion dollar companies to small e-commerce shops that you will have never ever heard of. Um, the reason that we're able to do that and work on such a disparate group of industries and verticals is that we just have a methodology that works. Um, you never lose by putting your customers first. You never lose by taking a data-driven approach to your strategy. Um, and that's allowed us to kind of work with companies of all shapes and sizes. And that's something that we're very proud of, um, considering we haven't even been around five years yet. All right, so just getting into the nitty gritty, um, I realize that we don't have a huge amount of time and I've got quite a lot of content to cover. Um, so as uh, Vipul said, please just uh, chuck any questions uh, into the go to uh, webinar control panel and I'll try and answer them uh, as, as I go along. So when we talk about building data-driven strategies, um, what we're essentially talking about is the process of conversion optimization. Um, a lot of people see conversion optimization as just something that happens on the website, but it doesn't need to be. It's actually something that you look at from end to end, from how you're attracting your traffic, where you're attracting your traffic from, to your content, to your website experience, to email marketing. It covers every step of the conversion funnel. So in short, um, conversion optimization is the process of crafting customer journeys that convert. And if you're crafting customer journeys that convert, you are naturally going to be building a very loyal customer base. The higher your conversion rate is usually a really good indication that you've addressed their pain points, you've addressed their motivations, you understand their behaviors, and then the strategy that you've built addresses all of that. Um, so this is, I guess, the process that I'm walking you through today. Why is it important? Um, a couple of reasons. Number one, people don't come to your site just because they have nothing better to do. They come to your site for a reason. They either want to inquire, they want to learn more, they want to buy something. So conversion optimization allows you to make it really easy for them to do whatever it is that they came there to do. Um, the second benefit is you really get to learn about who your customers are. I know we speak to a lot of companies, we sit in a lot of uh, boardrooms, and it never ceases to amaze us how a lot of people think that they know who their customer is, but actually their personas are horribly outdated or they've been grouped together by age or demographic profile 
rather than psychographic profiles like motivations. Um, so conversion optimization is valuable because when you have that information, um, you can actually optimize your entire uh, digital uh, strategy across all channels. Uh, this is probably one of my favorite stats in relation to conversion optimization. So for every $92 that, uh, that companies spend on driving traffic to their website, only $1 is spent on trying to convert those customers. And when you think about the fact that cost per clicks uh, for AdWords and Bing are going to continue to go up as things get more competitive, when you think about the fact that um, you know, SEO is also highly competitive and is you know, constantly moving target, people aren't spending enough time focusing on what happens when the traffic hits their website because that experience is 100% within your control. Um, and then finally, why is conversion optimization important? Well, you're no longer actually being compared to your competitors. So if I'm under armor, as an example, I shouldn't just be looking at what Nike is doing in the digital space. I should be looking at what beauty brands are doing. I should be looking at uh, literally anyone in, in the digital space, people who sell travel wallets or watches. Even though you're not necessarily competitive, we live in an era where uh, our rate of technology is increasing exponentially and technological use and uh, I guess the ability to provide really personalized experiences. So if I'm buying a pair of shoes from Nike, but I've just had a really good experience on uh, a company that sells, uh, for example, there's a company that sells travel wallets here um, in Australia called Bellroy. Highly recommend you check out their UX, it's pretty phenomenal. But if I've just bought something from them, and then I go to the Nike website and I find that their experience is incredibly lackluster by comparison. It doesn't really matter what Under Armour are doing. You need to be the best in digital in general, not just compared to your competitors. So finally, this is how most people approach their digital strategies. Um, they prioritize opinions over data. Um, some of you may have heard the term HIPPO being used. Uh, it's an acronym that stands for highest paid person's opinion. Again, it never ceases to amaze me how often decisions are made in this way. People who feel that they know best, people who've maybe been at a company for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, but they haven't necessarily kept up to date with who their customers are, with what's happening in the digital world, with what's actually available out there. So uh, I guess the strategies are being built based on opinions, and this is a really good way to drop customer loyalty quickly. So this is essentially what we want to do. We want to flip things around. We want to use the data, not opinions approach. So this is, uh, this is how it works. So from a methodology perspective, if you want to build data-driven strategies, if you want to foster customer loyalty, um, this is your methodology that you can follow. Now, the really the most important parts that you want to be focusing on here are the research and analysis components. If you get the research and analysis components wrong, then your hypotheses are going to be incorrect. And then whatever it is that you implement, whatever it is that you're going to be testing is not going to work. So a lot of companies are really in a rush to, I guess, skip through the research and analysis components and get to the more tangible parts like the, the physical implementation. But by doing so, they essentially are losing out on uh, the most valuable part of this whole process. So how do we do uh, the research and analysis phase? Well, we're looking for trends and patterns across multiple data sources. So uh, again, one of, the, one of the big things that we see, so this is, I guess, some of the research uh, methods that we use. And one of the big things that we often see is, for example, someone does a customer survey, and uh, it seems like there's a few people who complain maybe about delivery turnaround times or um, certain buttons or uh, functionality isn't working on the website properly. And so people are in a rush to just go and fix everything, but they haven't actually validated it across other data sources. And this is, I guess, a really critical component when you're building your data-driven strategies. The more data sources you've used to validate a hypothesis, the more likely that hypothesis is to be successful and the more likely it is to actually deliver an uplift for, for your website. So if you see something in analytics or if you see something in session recordings, then you wanna validate that through surveys or through user interviews. Um, so again, if, if, you're build, if you build a hypothesis and it has four or five different data sources 
that have validated it, then that goes to the very top of the list um, of things that you want to test or implement. And if you only see it on one data source, then it might be that you need to just continue the research um, to continue validating it. Um, so we kind of split our research up into quantitative and qualitative. Um, I think another place where a lot of people go wrong is they tend to do one or the other. They jump into Google Analytics or they jump into Omniture and they have a browse around and they find a couple of insights and then that becomes their, their golden egg. Um, but it's not, um, it's not being continuously researched. Um, so we look at it from both sides. We want to look at uh, people in their natural environment. So things like session recordings or heat maps where people don't know that you're kind of tracking their behaviors and their movements to staged behaviors like user interviews, user testing, customer surveys, where they know that you're monitoring their behavior and they're actively giving you answers in response to questions. Um, and then you've got all of your quantitative stuff like uh, analytics as well. So we kind of combine all of that together in the research phase. And then that allows us to go into the ideation component. So these are some of the tools that we use. I uh, highly recommend for you guys as well, um, if you haven't looked at them already. Uh, so Google Analytics, look, this is, this is a staple. This is kind of one-on-one stuff. If you're using Omniture, um, sometimes it's good to have analytics on there as well, just because Omniture as an Adobe product is not as intuitive as analytics. It can provide a lot of information, but analytics is often easier to use for kind of the rest of your team. Um, Typeform is a really good one if you want to be doing customer surveys. Um, they have a really beautiful user experience. You can brand all the surveys. You can host them online on your website. Um, you can have kind of if this then that functions and dependencies so you can push people through different journeys depending on how they're answering questions. Um, so we use this one a lot um, from, a, from a surveys perspective. Um, Hotjar is kind of a bit of an all-in-one tool. For those of you who are looking for something a little bit more cost effective, it um, allows you to do your heat mapping, your session recordings. It allows you to do recruitment for user testing. Um, there's, there's a lot that it can do there. It can do some form tracking as well. But because it's an all-in-one tool, um, sometimes, it's, um, sometimes it doesn't do certain things as good as others. I've actually realized that I've left Crazy Egg off this list. I apologize. So we also use Crazy Egg um, for heat mapping um, and scroll mapping, depth mapping. So um, I highly recommend uh, having Crazy Egg on your site and active at all times. Um, user Biller is just a, a, a customer feedback tool. Um, again, it can do some of what those other ones are doing. So I'm just kind of showing you different ecosystems that you can combine uh, however you like. Uh, user Biller is excellent from a UX perspective because if someone is having an issue somewhere on the site, um, there's like a little pop-up that comes up and it takes a screenshot of where they are on the page. They can leave a comment. Um, and then you can actually go and see the problem live. So there's a lot of value in what Usabilla offers. Um, it's also a really good customer feedback tool. And then Formissimo is essentially just form tracking. So if you are an inquiry-based business and you have long forms, I highly recommend using Formissimo because it just allows you to see um, where people are dropping off in the process. So maybe they're spending a particularly long time on certain parts of the form, um, or maybe certain parts of the form are broken, or maybe you're asking too much information, so it'll actually tell you where you're losing them. And then Content Square is kind of like a combination of all of them. Um, this is more of an enterprise tool, and you're kind of talking about 8,000 Australian dollars a month as a starting point. So if you're a bigger company, um, I can actually recommend Content Square because what they're doing is pretty phenomenal, but then you've got something like Hotjar that's kind of like a couple hundred dollars. So it's the it's it's a huge difference in cost, but it, there's also a huge difference in capability. So once you kind of spend your time in that discover and understand components, you're get, kind of gathering all your data, um, you're using Google Sheets or something more visual to collect all of your insights, that's when you go into the ideation phase. So that those pictures that you see there, there's really kind of no way not to make this process manual and visual. You kind of need to take a big step back and actually have a look at it and pin everything on the wall and group things together by things like pain points and motivations and behaviors and start actually mapping out the user journey because um, what you think who you think might be your competitors are not necessarily your competitors. We had like a really interesting instance um, with a company that does uh, tailor-made suits. 
And they always assumed that other companies that did tailor-made suits were their uh, first competitors. Um, but actually, as it turns out, uh, most people go and try and buy off the rack first, realize that they might be uh, a shape or size that makes buying off the rack difficult, kind of like for myself. Um, and so then they realize that it's probably easier for them just to go and get something tailor-made. So when you look at it from a customer journey perspective and the keywords that you're targeting and who your competitors are and how you're talking to your customers, what their pain points are, it, it completely changes that entire journey. And when, you, when we changed the content on the site to start talking to people like myself who had had really bad experiences buying kind of off the rack suits, um, it completely changed the process and uh, their conversion rates and engagement rates. But then more than that, because they had a good product, because they communicated um, to their customers through every step of the funnel, they actually built a lot of loyalty because that funnel, that conversion optimization, those insights also translated to how we optimize their in-store experience. So when you're kind of building, um, I guess, all of your, uh, your data-driven insights and when you're building your actionables off the back of that, just remember that it doesn't have to be limited, as I said in the beginning, to just your website. You can take those insights and apply them to advertising, radio, TV, print. You can apply them to SEO, to biddable, to email marketing. So um, those insights are multi-channel in their use. And then from there, you might want to start testing things. So if you are focusing on your digital experience, obviously we, we recommend using uh, VWO as your A-B testing tool. Um, any client that we have from an A-B testing perspective, we use VWO. We just find them super easy to use, very easy to integrate. Um, quick to set up um, and they have a, a lot of really excellent support. So uh, we, we use them pretty extensively. Really, if you're, if you're gonna be testing um, on site, just make sure that you've done that discovery and understand component because it is really, really critical first. Otherwise, a lot of people jump straight into the testing and then, then they find that a lot of their tests fail and they don't understand why. And then they just think, well, testing isn't for me. It's not working for us. Let's just not do it but it just means that you haven't gone through the proper steps first. So this is another really big one. Take your time with this process. Again, research is so, so critical. Um, when you look at uh, management consulting firms like McKinsey, there's lots of management consulting firms out there. What separates McKinsey and what makes them so much better than other management consulting firms and what has made them so famous is their ability to ask the right question at the right time to the right people and to dig a little bit deeper. And I think that this is the major stumbling block for a lot of people when they're trying to build their strategies is they're often not using, they're not asking the right questions because they don't have the right data. So really take your time here, don't rush it. Um, and if, if something doesn't feel right, then it's okay to dig deeper. I understand that stakeholder management is important here and often there's higher ups who kind of want, want you to rush through because they want, you know, everyone's got KPIs and goals they need to hit but it's really important to set proper processes from the very get-go. Um, so that's, uh, this is, I guess, a, a really big part for us. So in terms of timelines, just to give you guys an indication of how things work um, for us. So generally speaking, we're talking about anywhere between eight to 12 to 16 weeks. Um, a lot of this will depend heavily on user recruitment. So if you're going to be doing user interviews, particularly if you're going to be doing eight, 10, 12 of them, it's, it can be difficult to recruit people. Um, people are busy, people cancel, you've got your own meetings that you need to do. Um, so that process can blow things out. But generally speaking, things like Google Analytics set up an optimization and analysis, um, heat maps, if you've got enough traffic and session recordings, you can get those things done earlier on and you can already start to build your insights. And then you kind of want to be validating, as I said, as you keep going through. So for example, if you do your uh, Google Analytics analysis in the first month, you go and you build all of your insights from there. Then in the next month, you go and you do a couple of user interviews and some live surveys and some customer surveys. And then you start asking questions based off the first round of insights. You see what is validated and what isn't. The things that are validated, then in the third round of surveys and interviews, you can kind of continue that process. And that's essentially how you build um, your overall strategy and how you kind of tie in, um, how you tie in insights across, uh, across multiple data sources. 
So at the end of the third or fourth month, depending on how much traffic you have and how many interviews that you've done, that's when you kind of want to put the report together. And from our perspective, it's really important to take other teams that are going to be involved on the journey here. Take your marketing team along on the journey. Take your brand team along on the journey. If you have a, a digital agency who's handling your SEO or your biddable media, take them along on the journey because all of these insights are super, super valuable to them. Don't have this be a project in isolation, kind of under lock and key. The, make, make the data free, uh, set it free and let it be uh, free flowing. So then this is kind of how we, we build things out. So there'll be some things that are really obvious that you don't need to test. As an example, um, sometimes we see in heat maps that uh, people are, there's a huge heat map over where people are trying to click on a button and they're trying to click on that button repetitively, but that button actually isn't clickable and it doesn't go anywhere. So you don't need to test making that button clickable. You can just make it clickable. Um, but then things like uh, adding new features, adding functionality, um, rewriting content, those are things that you would actually want to test and build hypothesis for. So some things you can just implement straight away and some things you can put into your testing plan. So just in terms of testing, um, again, uh, I think that from a testing perspective, a lot of people are quick to jump to this stage, but then they also don't test properly. Um, a couple of really core components to testing. Um, number one, uh, please make sure that you test in full weeks. So for example, if you start on a Monday afternoon, you have to finish on a Monday afternoon. You can't finish on a Friday morning because you need to account for variations throughout the week. So if you have huge volumes of traffic, if you're getting you know, a million plus visits to your website a month, you might be able to run a test every one or two weeks. But if you're getting 20, 30,000 visits to your website a month, you might need to run that test for a full month because you also need a minimum of 250 conversions per variation. So you you've got your control and then you've got your variation that you've designed. So you need 250 of whatever your conversion metric is on each variation before you can actually call a winner. And then the last component is you need to have at least a 95% statistical confidence. So this is, uh, again, a really big one that we see a lot of people skip over. They see the statistical confidence in VWO get to maybe 70 or 80%, and then they go and implement it, and they're surprised when after implementing it, they don't see the uplift. That's because 70 or 80% when it comes to testing isn't good enough. You need to see 95 to 99% statistical confidence. If you don't see that, then do a little bit of analysis, figure out where your uh, hypothesis may have been slightly off the mark, and then rebuild the test and rerun it. Um, so again, the, the actual testing component is the bottom of the funnel, right? So this is where you kind of make your bread and butter. This is where you validate the fact that your data-driven strategies and your data-driven approach is working. So there's a lot of pressure on this side, on this part, of your strategy. Um, so it's just really important that you follow proper testing protocols. Um, otherwise, eventually people are going to realize that it's it's not working. And I think there's also an expectation that when you when you're doing A B testing, that every test is going to be a winner or a lot of them. But that's actually not the case. Um, I think the global stat is that on average one out of seven tests are winners. Right? It's not a lot, but that one test can be a 10 or 20 or 30% uplift. We've run tests for our clients where there's between 80 to 120% uplift because yes, partially things were quite broken to begin with, but also the hypothesis was so big and there were so many touch points that were validated that the second we made that change, it made a, it made a huge difference to their business. So even if you are kind of getting two or three tests out of seven as a success rate, that's actually two to three times the global average. So you're doing pretty well. So just when you're doing your stakeholder management, Definitely, definitely keep that in mind. Okay, so I realized that we're kind of running out of time, but I just wanted to show you how you might integrate some of your insights from your conversion optimization process into your other channels. So from an SEO and content perspective, when you're doing your surveys and when you're doing your interviews and you're doing your competitor analysis, you can actually start looking at what type of search terms your customers are using to find and browse your products, um, which can then feed into your content strategy. Same thing is you can actually see what questions your customers are asking, 
when you know their pain points and their motivations, um, you can write content that addresses that. You can push that through social. Um, you can push that through email marketing. Um, you can also ask them what type of information they need in order to make a purchase decision, which affects your on-page content. This is particularly valuable um, in the e-commerce space. Um, so from an SEO and content perspective, I think that there's a huge amount of value in doing this kind of research and understanding who your customer is because a lot of people just kind of want to target very broad keywords, but this will allow you to look at your more long tail keywords and build a really specific uh, approach with traffic that converts rather than just drives uh, visibility and awareness. Um, from a biddable perspective, so again, uh, looking at things like major pain points and motivations, you can use that in your site link extensions. Um, you can use that um, in terms of the types of keywords that you're targeting. You can use that in your landing pages. Um, you can use that in building your competitor strategy. So if, if you are the type of company that likes to bid on competitor keywords because you operate in that kind of a highly competitive space, um, then this is uh, your opportunity to find out who the competitors actually are. And then building out your pain points into your ad copy will make you stand out even more. Um, also understanding, you know, looking at analytics or omniture and understanding how many touch points a customer needs before they actually purchase from you will also allow you to figure out how many potential biddable channels uh, you should be across. Should you have retargeting? Do you need display? Should you be using video and YouTube? Is paid social an effective channel for you? If you need four touch points with a customer, how do you go and build those four touch points? And then from an email marketing and CRM perspective, so again, um, if you're building out more effective persona profiles, uh, you can then go and build that out in your CRM. Uh, you can have more, uh, I guess, specific fields in your CRM um, that you want to collect in terms of data on your customers. You can then leverage, you can pull that data into AdWords to build more specific audiences. You can pull that data into paid social to build specific audiences. Um, and then you're, can also, you're also asking them what would need to happen for them to become advocates, to leave reviews. Um, so you can build that into your automation and your email sequences uh, post-purchase to try and get reviews and build loyalty and understand uh, who your customers are. So in terms of kind of next steps, as I mentioned, there's, there's a whole bunch of tools. Um, this, this will be available uh, for you guys, this presentation, so you can kind of um, go through through this part yourselves. I'm, I'm again just conscious of time and the fact that we um, we want to have a bit of a Q&A session um, for those who want to ask questions. Um, but I think that this is one of the areas that a lot of people want to start investing in, but they often don't know where. So I think the tools that I've given you, they're super easy to use. They're very intuitive to set up. Um, you don't need to be a developer. Um, you can use Google Tag Manager, or if you have a dev team, you can essentially just send them the codes and they'll install it all for you. You can set it up, most of these tools, you can set up yourself in probably like 10 minutes. Um, so it's, it's not that complicated to use. Um, but the big thing for us is make sure, again, just reiterating the super important points. Don't just, number one, don't just focus on driving traffic, focus on converting traffic. Because if you want to have a loyal customer base, you need to build a digital experience um, that is best in class. And I fully appreciate that people have limitations on platform, on budgets, on timelines, on capabilities. Um, but if you really want to be growing in, in the digital space and you really want to be ha harnessing the power of data, at some point you're going to have to make the call to start investing in this space. Um, so use the tools that are available out there. There's always more and more coming out. Um, spend the time on the research and analysis piece. Um, if you can do it in-house yourselves, fantastic. If you don't have the resources or the time, find someone who can help you do that. And it doesn't have to be an agency. It can be a freelancer um, or hire a team in-house um, you know, who specialize in this space because it's just getting to the point now where if you're not using data to build your digital strategies, then ultimately you're you're not building you're not setting yourself up for success. Um, so that's pretty much it for me. I really appreciate your time. Again, I know that everyone is online at totally different times. For some people, it's very early in the morning. For some people, it's the evening. Either way, thank you very much, and happy to take any questions that are out there. 
great uh, that was really a great presentation michael and it was really comprehensive as well thank you so much for that so yeah no before we begin with the question uh, and answer section i want to highlight uh, uh, one of your earlier slides in which you mentioned that people uh, the consumers of today don't really compare you with your competitors they compare you with the best digital experiences in the world so that's right that's quite a takeaway uh, for me and for everyone i believe because uh, it's a very competitive environment and people want the best of the experience absolutely i mean it's it's interesting because there's um there's a company i think they're called diamond candles so um they're they're um unique selling proposition is that I think it's one in every 10,000 candles has a diamond ring in it. So it's, it's a pretty obscure thing like candles, but their, um, their unique selling proposition and the actual checkout experience is one of the better ones that I've seen online. Same things I was saying, Bellroy, the travel wallet company. And, you know, some of our clients like Converse, for example, big global brand, you know, they might look and see what uh, other players in their space are doing. But they're not going to go and look at what a diamond, uh, what a uh, what a candle company is doing, and try and imitate what what their digital experience is. But they should be because their checkout is so smooth. And if Converse implemented something like that, it would probably have an uplift in conversion rate, assuming that you know you do the research first and customers say yes, the checkout process is broken. But it's more the process of like seeing what else is out there and understanding that people are going to be comparing you to all of those companies, not just to the people who are in your space. Right, absolutely great. So, uh, so yeah, I think we can now start with the Q&A section. And the first question that I want to pick up right now is one that came from Tanya. So uh, she's basically referring to a slide wherein you talked about uh, getting 20,000 visitors on your website. And you talked yep. about 250 conversions. So she basically just wanted to, uh, you know, have a little bit more understanding of how you uh, came to those numbers. Yeah. So I mean, those those are basically kind of global best practices in terms of having 250 conversions as a minimum on each variation. So if you're running an ABC test, you've got your control and maybe two variations. You would need 250 conversions on every single one of them. Um, the reason is that again, same as the 95 percent statistical confidence, same as testing for, you know, entire weeks. We just want to make sure that the, we're not getting a false positive, right? You want to make sure that um, the outcomes uh, before you implement it are actually going to generate an uplift because if you're going to go and spend, I don't know, depending on uh, if you're building new features of functionality, it might cost you five, $10,000 to go and implement one of those features. You want to make sure that it's actually beneficial to you which is why we want to see those minimum conversion numbers. Um, in terms of your traffic level, that is probably less important because you might have small traffic, but a huge amount of inquiries depending on what your business is. So you'll actually be able to generate those insights faster. Right. So yeah, Tanya, I hope uh, it's now clear to you. Uh, otherwise, we'll of course be sharing the recording of this webinar and then you can uh, watch it again to uh, clarify things for yourself. Right. So, uh, another, the second question actually comes from me. So I was actually thinking, so you put a lot of stress upon, uh, the research part, right? But research is something that takes a lot of time. So how do like big businesses who, for whom the time is valuable, uh, what are the do's and don'ts, uh, of research so that, uh, there's, you <coughs> you know, insights from research and not really wasting their time on, on uh, doing, on asking questions or doing research that doesn't really matter. Yeah, look, um, I think from my perspective, if you want to be successful in digital, like there's some things that you just can't rush. You can't cut corners. Um, and if you do, then you're ultimately getting poor insights, which means your strategies are going to be even a couple of degrees off. If they're a couple of degrees off, then that can have a huge impact on your overall business. Um, I think that there will be some companies who, yes, are time poor. So you might want to cut out certain data sources that might take you a little bit longer. For example, if you have very, very low traffic, I'm talking about maybe like 
a couple of thousand visits to your website a month, then something like heat maps might take you a really long time to do. So you might want to skip straight into things like customer surveys because you have a database of 50,000 people that you can lean on. Um, you might want to go straight into user interviews um, and doing a competitor analysis as part of your user interviews and user testing processes. So I don't want to be like, I would never recommend for you to be cutting out too many data sources um, because you never know where you're going to get the golden nugget from that, you know, ends up being a, a million dollar idea. So if you are time poor, then find a way to outsource it to someone else who's an expert in this area who can do it on your behalf. Um, I mean, yes, that is why agencies exist. It's why freelancers exist. There's you know, lots of people who specialize in this area that you can also hire in-house. Um, it is a highly coveted skill for the exact reason that uh, the ROI on this level of research is significantly more than on a lot of other um, on a lot of other marketing strategies because this is applicable across everything. If you do the research over the course of ten weeks and then you get that golden insight and then you apply it across TV, radio, biddable content, and UX, you can be talking about millions of dollars to your bottom line with these changes. So you know, in the interest of saving two weeks, I can't really recommend trying to cut a corner. Um, what I can recommend is if you're not seeing uh, certain hypotheses being uh, validated across multiple data sources, move on from them more quickly. And just keep your focus on the ones where you might have you know, three, four, or five different data sources validating your hypothesis, because that's, that's going to be, your, um, that's gonna be your, your big winner. Right. Or just might uh, reach out to Yoga Digital directly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that, that is also totally an option, if, uh, if you please. Uh, we're always more than happy to have a chat. Right. So uh, the next question comes from Jessica. So Jessica is asking, what would you do if you had an enterprise client that have large enough budgets, but they are slow in implementation and there's a lot of red tape involved? How would you yep. implement um, your research processes there? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so we we uh, have done work with one of the big four banks here uh, in in Australia, and this is like perfect example of um, kind of a, the red tape and bureaucracy of kind of large corporate clients who have budget but um, don't necessarily have uh, the manpower to implement. Ironically enough, um, so in situations like that, um, the the biggest part is stakeholder management. So it's how you set the project up for success from the very beginning. And it's what I was saying about taking people along the journey. We often find that people tend to just kind of dive into this type of a project and not tell anyone about it and not actually explain the benefits. And so eventually you kind of have this phenomenal report and then you kind of come to the higher ups or to the board or to uh, you know, senior management, and you tell them, look, this is all the research we've done, this is everything we want to do, but their immediate pushback is, well, we don't have the budget, we don't have the time, we've got other priorities, because at that point, they actually don't understand the value. So the first thing that we would do is whenever we work with a client, when we do our initial sales meetings and kickoff meetings with them, is we understand um, who are the stakeholders that we will need to be working with, um, what are uh, internally on their side? Um, what is some of the, I guess, red tape that we might have to get around? And what's the best way to do so? Um, the other thing that you can also offer is kind of, if you're an agency, then you want to take as much as possible off their plate. So, you know, sometimes clients push back and say, well, we can implement it on our side, but nine times out of 10, they don't. Because again, things get deprioritized. Um, so the more you, uh, as an agency, the more you can build capability within your own team to do the A-B testing, the wireframe, the design, the hypothesis, the research, and you take that pressure off of your large corporate client to have to handle the implementation, you can do things faster. And when you look at tools like VWO, they're very easy to install. So there's usually not a lot of red tape in getting that put onto a website, as opposed to if you were doing things like server-side testing, um, which means you have to get 
the development team of your client involved. And then that becomes a much bigger project. And that's when things sometimes get a bit hairy. So number one, um, I think just bringing stakeholders along for the ride and any other teams that will be affected by this level of research and analysis along for the ride. And then taking as much pressure off them and onto yourself as possible. Right, makes sense. So another question also comes from Jessica. Uh, she's asking, would CRO help with the above the line tactics like television and radio? That's interesting. As in how, as in how does CRO affect, sorry? Uh, I think she's asking, uh, can CRO help in, you know, can you oh, use can yes. you CRO in television and radio? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so again, if you look at the entire digital experience, uh, the entire, uh, sorry, conversion funnel, that might start with TV or radio, right? If someone is in the awareness, consideration or research phases, then offline channels will drive people online. Where uh, insights from your data become applicable there is, again, looking at things like pain points and motivations. So if you understand, um, kind of coming back to the uh, example that I gave about myself buying off the rack suits versus tailor-made suits, if I understand that the pain point is that off the rack just is not for me and that there is an option out there that is cost-effective, time-effective, um, and high quality, I can then use that in my TV advertising, in my radio advertising. I can start addressing those pain points to people in other channels. So for sure, um, the insights that you gather here, because when you're looking at things like user testing and user interviews, um, you're not just looking at their how they're behaving on your site. You're actually trying to get into their mind frame. You're trying to build those persona profiles. And the way we group persona profiles is by motivations and pain points, because you can have someone in two completely different age brackets who have the same pain point. So you want to be talking to them in the same way rather than just necessarily talking to people in the same age bracket who have totally separate pain points. Um, so you can definitely take the insights from this research and apply it to uh, offline channels. Right. Hope, you answer, hope your questions are answered, Jessica. So uh, I'll take just two more questions. Uh, one is sure. coming from Amy. Uh, I hope you pr I pronounced your name correctly, Amy. I'm sorry if, if I didn't. Uh, so Amy is asking, uh, what are the low-hanging fruits or easiest solutions uh, to implement if we are new to CRO? Yeah, cool. Um, so I think things like a crazy egg is a really easy one. Um, hot jar as well. You can build in your session recordings. You can do little live pop-up surveys on your website. Um, and you can do customer surveys. So even if you're new to CRO, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have a small email marketing database, and you can certainly be leveraging that. Um, so I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't say, well, we're new to CRO, therefore we can't use all these tools. You absolutely can, and you should. Um, we are big believers in in learning by doing. Um, so we we do a lot of, I guess, consulting with with our clients as well in terms of upskilling their teams. And as I said, most of these tools are are really simple to use. They're very uh, intuitive. Um, you know, if you jumped into Hotjar, honestly, you'd, you'd figure it out in like 10 minutes um, and you could have data collecting in the background. Um, so I would start even with some really simple data points like heat maps and session recordings and a live pop up survey on your website and having a look at Google Analytics. That already is for data sources that you weren't using before that you can be using now um, and you can kind of practice building hypotheses. Um, again, if you're new to CRO, I'm hoping that there is some patience within your business when you kind of try new initiatives. So again, it'll be really important to explain to them that this is new, that it's not necessarily like, and not every test is going to be a winner because I think if you guys are new to it and you're planning on doing it all in-house and learning, that stakeholder management piece is going to be super, super crucial for you guys um, just to set proper expectations and then under-promise, over-deliver. Right. So a la the last question uh, is from me. So I, uh, you know, I, I just, I'm just curious, does one really need to have uh, extensive understanding of, you know, statistics to run successful CRO program? 
Oh, that's a really good question. And the answer is no, you, know, you, you actually don't, um, which is great because I was never particularly good at math. Um, but I think really what you need to have an understanding of is just how to group concepts together um, and how to read through that information um, and combine those insights. Um, so that doesn't necessarily have to make you good at math. It just means that you have to be, I think, um, intuitive to the insights that customers are trying to give you. Um, you know, for example, one of the big things that we often find is that um, companies, when they send out surveys, um, they make questions multiple choice um, and or like limited options. But what you're doing there is immediately limiting the scope of the answer that you can get. So our preference is actually to ask really open-ended questions and then kind of let people rant and ramble and say whatever it is that they want to say. Because again, that's where you're going to get the major insights from as opposed to giving people multiple choice options. Um, because you know, uh, some, if you ask someone to rate your digital experience on a scale of one to 10, someone else's seven might be my five or vice versa. So that number actually isn't meaningful where if you ask them a question like, um, what do you like about our digital experience and what do you not like? You've now opened up the door for them to really talk to those experiences. And that doesn't require any mathematical understanding. And um, that just, again, comes back to asking the right questions to the right people. Right. That's actually a question that we usually see uh, being asked by uh, a lot of VW customers and uh, uh, prospects. Uh, and this is statistics, uh, the word itself sort of fears, uh, scares away a lot of people. So I just wanted to have an understanding if it is really that important. So yeah, thanks for uh, saving the burden, Michael. <laughs> no problems. Great. So yeah, I think with that, it's time to close this webinar. Uh, thank you so much, Michael, uh, for your time and effort that you've put into creating this wonderful uh, and very insightful presentation. And no worries. Thank you very much for having me. Great. And thank you so much, everyone, for attending this webinar. Uh, please fill the survey that will turn up once this webinar is closed. Your feedback will help us a lot. Uh, have a good day, everyone.